Welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our exploration of the 2,000-year-old Catholic intellectual tradition. I am Dr. Benjamin Smith, lecturer in philosophy with Catholic Studies Academy. I'm joined today by Dr. Richard Bozzichelli, our lecturer in theology. Today we're going to talk about the ontology or the metaphysics of transubstantiation in the Eucharist, uh, which is an important and uh, uh, challenging uh, topic. Uh, So I think this is going to be a a great opportunity for us to learn and to grow. Uh, But before we get started, uh, let's remember the basics. Uh, If you enjoy this video, if you're edified by it, uh, please uh, hit that like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel, share uh, this video with your friends uh, your, and colleagues. Um, and in fact, if you would like to go ahead and support our work, please hit that thank you button uh, and the, uh, below uh, the screen here. Uh, and if you want to go further in your own intellectual growth, your own growth in faith, uh, please go over to catholicstudiesacademy.com, our website, where you can purchase our courses or uh, where you can um, become a subscriber to our courses, in which case you'll uh, have an opportunity to view well over, I think, Rich, at this point, a dozen courses uh, in theology and uh, philosophy. So it's a great opportunity um, uh, for you there. Okay, so let's get started. Um, Today, we want to talk about the ontology and metaphysics of... uh, the Eucharist, right? Um, And uh, it's um, uh, a great topic. It's a challenging topic. It's a difficult topic. Um, But uh, Dr. Bozzichelli is an expert in this area, and so he's going to guide us through this. In particular, we're going to focus on what St. Thomas Aquinas has to say uh, about uh, this uh, subject matter uh, and work through several hypotheses that he uh, considers and then uh, rejects, right? Uh, you know, sort of Thomas is very good at this kind of methodology of sort of, you know, we have this difficult uh, question to answer. Here are some possible answers. Well, these don't work. This is why they don't work. And then kind of narrowing it down to sort of his best answer uh, that he can uh, give at the time. Um, Dr. Wilson Kelly, could you start us off by talking, give us a little bit of context for this question uh, and, and, you know, sort of the approach that Thomas Aquinas in particular takes to it in terms of trying to work out um, what transubstantiation means and doesn't mean. And perhaps you can really just get a, begin with just a little bit of an overview about the term transubstantiation. Yeah. So, so you know, I think one of the mistakes that we tend to make when, when we read St. Thomas, um, mm-hmm. particularly from within the perspective of, um, you know, a very kind of aware and aware catholicism if you mm-hmm. follow what i'm saying sure sure um you know we um we tend to actually the the mistake we make is we tend to think he sort of fell out of the sky in in, <laughs> in uh, the 13th century right, and right. you know and there's no like history behind what he's saying we just sure. he just comes up with all these brilliant formulations right right in fact transubstantiation is not a term that he invented right. um although we associate it with him Sure. very very closely probably because he, he gave one of the most interesting explanations of it sure that um that that the church has had to work with but the term actually came into existence somewhere around the 11th century um and it's closely associated with the dispute over uh, Berenger, with Baron with berengar of tours an 11th century um priest and theologian who denied the true presence of Christ. And he held a view that ultimately was essentially the same as that later adopted by Ulrich Zwingli uh, during the Protestant Reformation, mm-hmm. which was really pure, um, uh, not Ulrich Zwingli, excuse me, uh, John Calvin, okay. uh, which, was, um, which was a sort of representationalist view, but uh, not a, it, wasn't as, um, it wasn't as strong a representationalist view as Ulrich Zwingli. Ulrich Zwingli is pure representational, sure. right? In other words, right. what this means is um, during the during the uh, the mass, right? Mm-hmm. The bread and wine are introduced, and they simply represent after the consecration the body and blood of Christ. But they they're just bread and wine, the same as they were when the mass started. Right. right that would be right. a pure representationalist view. Sure. Right? Sure. Purely symbolic. There's there's no ontological change. There's there's no change in being. Gotcha. John Calvin 
and Berengar of Tours held a somewhat different view than that, okay. which was that they took on the capacity uh, after the consecration to, um, to bind those who received those sacraments piously mm -hmm. um, in spirit, right? By way right. of anticipation right. to the glorified body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so their view, you might consider it a, um, a moderate, you might consider their view sort of a moderate true presence right um, thesis, right i've heard something like that before there's sort of like uh really but spiritually you know yeah you right. kind of uh, terminology uh i think uh, i might be incorrect about this but i think that calvin actually uses the phrase real presence um in some of his works but he means by that like really 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 spiritually, but spiritually right. right yeah right, yeah right. so um but i mean i think that's important to say you know it's not that he completely denies that there's any that there's any, um, you know, there's anything funky going on, right? Right, sure, um, sure. Uh, but, but whatever it is, it's not what has traditionally been taught. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Berengar of Tours, uh, you know, back in the, in the 11th century, mm -hmm. was a, a pariah, right? I mean, already he had gone <laughs> off the rails. The, the, belief, the belief in the true presence in the way that the Catholic Church understands it. Now, mm -hmm. I'm, let's... Let's say in the way that the Catholic Church understands it, let's not get it. I'm not making that statement with all the metaphysical, the, all the metaphysical stuff about transubstantiation. Okay, sure. Let's just, but what I mean is that um, when the consecration takes place, there's actually the body and blood of Christ, and we have a physical encounter with it. Right. All right. Gotcha. Somehow. Um, mm -hmm. That view is clearly patristic mm -hmm. i think there's um there's no there's no way around that if you if you look at um if you look at peter lombard's um sentences book mm -hmm. four he catalogs and this is just a very brief a, a cursory glance at the history of it mm -hmm. but he catalogs numerous patristic sources in which they're all saying they're all saying consistently the same thing about but about what happens with consecration. Mm -hmm. And these are, you know, heavy hitters, Augustine and, and Ambrose. And, sure. and of course we know that, that um, you know, when you go back to the very early church, to the time of um, St. Justin, uh, J Justin Martyr, um, why did he get put to death? Why did he and his companions get, get put to death? Well, actually the charge against them was cannibalism. Mm -hmm. and, right, um, right, right. And, and he tried to, you know, under Roman law, that 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 was illegal. Sure. Um, and he and reasonably so, right? Yeah, we, I don't. We, really <laughs> have that. But he, he tried to. It, it, what he tries to do is to say, well, I know <laughs> cannibalism is is wrong, but this isn't really cannibalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting. He got put to death anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the Romans putting him to death. Romans who don't believe in Christianity. And probably mm -hmm. don't actually believe that the Eucharist is really Christ. Right, sure, but, sure. But notice, right, it would have been very easy for him to get off the hook. He would right, have said, right. look, it's just bread and wine. I mean, you can see that with your own eyes. But that's, <laughs> right. Not, right. that's not what he said, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He tried to that's argue important. that, he tried to argue that, um, you know, cannibalism is the consumption of, of, um, you know, flesh and blood of a corruptible body of a body that that has that's been, um, you know, it's been subject to decomposition, right? You've you've killed something and eaten it, sure. and that's not what we're doing here. We're gotcha. consuming Christ, yes, yeah, His true body and blood, but in a glorified form. Right. Um, Ignatius of Ignatius of Antioch talks about the Eucharist as the medium of immortality, and the reason here is that um becoming one with christ this is the crux of it all right so to speak becoming one with christ in body and blood is becoming one with the body and blood that not only has entered into death into a death like ours but which has triumphed over that death has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the father 
So when we become one with that flesh and blood, mm -hmm. then the what happens to that flesh and blood happens to us. Mm. That's what makes it the, the medicine of immortality. That's what guarantees the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come for Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of what's at stake yeah. in the fathers of the church on this question, right? I mean, that's really interesting, uh, Rich. Uh, it's good, kind of a good explanation of the importance of the matter. And I think one that really anybody, um, you know, who's seriously trying to discern these matters should have some sympathy with, right? That is your explanation is that when we become one, um with christ even physically then the things that happen to christ's body happens to us right right uh which we recognize and i think it, most theological traditions you know recognize some important place for union with christ right soteriologically yeah. right so i think that should be a explanation that is at least interesting uh to to the various traditions so notice in the primitive church particularly with Ignatius, this comes out, but Ignatius was only the sort of one of the first people to engage on this matter. Um, it, it was a problem that went on for centuries, namely sure. Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. uh, so very early on, right, uh, before, they had, before they were called Docetists, sure. uh, Ignatius was confronting people who did not believe in the incarnation. Mm -hmm. they, um, they believed that Christ only appeared to right. be physical right sure sure but you know god is pure spirit and he doesn't he doesn't mess around by mixing himself up with material things right, matter right. and spirit don't uh -huh. go together yeah so um of course they denied the importance of the eucharist they certainly deny that the eucharist was the true body and blood of christ since christ didn't have a body and blood mm, and mm -hmm. ignatius is addressing this he's saying that's mm -hmm. not enough right, right well why right. isn't it enough right mm -hmm. it, it's not enough because we're not just spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That's a good explanation. Um, great. So Thomas, when he's coming in and, and, and to, to enter into this sort of long discussion in the church, he doesn't introduce transubstantiation, but he gives it a particular treatment, right? Yeah. That's, um, right. that's, that's useful. Um, when, uh, and you, I think you said, Rich, that the, uh, that the term transubstantiation came in, came in, in the 11th century, around that around time? the 11th century, I, I don't know exactly when it first okay. appeared. There's, it's a little, its origins are a little bit obscure. Okay, but we know that it was, we know that it was incorporated as, um, as an articulation of an orthodox position. Right, right. Uh, right. At the Fourth Lateran Council. Okay, okay. So, so, um, so as as sort of like as a term developed to mark out the orthodox position against the position you were talking about earlier, right? Yeah, right, okay, right. I mean, it probably traces back sometime around um, Hugh of St. Victor or something okay. like that, right? Gotcha. Okay. So the weird thing about this position, right, mm -hmm. um, and y you'll, see this, you'll see this in Peter Lombard. Um, before there was the term transubstantiation, by the way, right? Lombard does, is not aware of this term. Mm -hmm. He still basically maintains this position, okay, that, that what, what, there, was body, there was bread and wine. Now okay. there isn't bread and wine. Gotcha. But the accidents of bread and wine remain. Mm -hmm. Yet, interestingly enough, he claims um, they inhere in no substance. <laughs> right. And that's sure. the position Aquinas ultimately adopts. Sure. All right. So I don't I don't know. I don't know if I would say that in order to affirm transubstantiation, in order, in order for you to say, I believe in transubstantiation, I don't know if I would say that you would have to affirm that the bread and wine in here and no substance in the way that, in the way that Lombard and Thomas would. I'm not sure what else you would say, though, and that's part of what right. Thomas gets into. Right? That's right. That's right. Um, I think it's so fascinating uh, in a way um, to, to that formulation, right? Accidents and hearing in no subject, right? I mean, that makes my Aristotelian, you know, bones just shake. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I always find it sort of a little annoying when people criticize Thomas or the Catholic Church. They'll say some uh, on this point, they'll say something like, in, uh, they incorporate Aristotelianism into uh, sacramental theology, right? Uh, and, and sort of let Arist Aristotelian categories take over sacramental theology. And I'm sort of like, well, 
you must not really have studied a lot of Aristotle, right? To say that, right? Because Aristotle, Aristotle didn't talk about the sacraments. Of much course not. Right? But even <laughs> like the whole idea of, of accidents and hearing and no substance is completely outside of the scope of what's allowed in um, philosophy of nature or Aristotelian and metaphysics, right? Um, you know, I think we could follow Thomas and say, yeah, it's a miracle. It's not contrary. It's, there's, there's a contradiction there. But it's not an Aristotelian position, right? It uses Aristotelian terminology, right, uh, to try to explain or articulate the, the mystery as far as it's possible. But it's, uh, but it's uh, not, you know, not. Uh, some sort of, like, uh, transformation of sacramental theology into Aristotelian metaphysics. Because Aristotelian metaphysics doesn't have such a thing, right, uh, of uh, uh, accidents, accidents not adhering in substance. substance. In fact, that's kind of the very definition of what an accident is metaphysically, right? Yeah, so if Thomas and Aristotle were having dinner with each other. <laughs> right, right. And at a restaurant, and, um, <laughs> you know, and, and they got to the point where Thomas was talking about transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. You know, you could sort of imagine the scene where, where like... Um, you know, Thomas is just getting into his explanation of, of how this works. And, mm -hmm. and, and you're really focused on St. Thomas. And then he finishes his explanation and there's dead silence. And, and, <laughs> and then you pan over to Aristotle and he's sitting there holding his fork with his mouth gaping open. He, he right. has the blank <laughs> on his face. He has no idea mm -hmm. what, what he, he what is he talking about? Like, what are you doing to my metaphysics? Right? So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the point at which, like, I realize this is not the guy I want to be talking to. After <laughs> that's, right, that's right. But that's kind of a side point. But I think it's so, actually um, important because you want to recognize that, that Thomas is using Aristotelian language, right, to try to, to, to offer the best explanation he can. Um, uh, but but he's not reducing anything to recitation. Yeah, I think this is one of those places where even if you do want to make that criticism of Thomas from time to time, I mean, I, I guess there are times when I, I would be inclined to do that, but but not in this instance. This mm -hmm. is one place where um, I, I don't think he's putting the, I don't think he's prioritizing Aristotelian metaphysics over um, sacramental theology. Mm -hmm. he's i mean he's he's faithful to the tradition right what is he doing well he's he's accepting what the fathers have said mm -hmm. about the true presence of christ he's adopting a term that had been ratified not as dogma but as mm -hmm. as a term that um the church kind of prefers to use right uh to describe what it is the fathers are describing sure um and he he tries to say, okay, well, let's unpack this term mm -hmm. and and see what sense we can make out of it. Can can we say anything about it metaphysically that's rational? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he goes through a number of different hypotheses that he rejects, and okay. he comes to one. He comes to the to the one that Peter Lombard had had affirmed, interesting, um, and says that's the right position. Okay. That's However interesting. Weird it is. All right, all right. So let's. Well, the, that's great. Uh, it's good background and context here. But let's work through a couple of those hypotheses, uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Kelly. What, what What are some of the hypotheses, possible ways of explaining this uh, mystery that Thomas rejects? Right. Okay. So first of all, let's start with the thesis that um, the accidents are just kind of illusions. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, for many of us, you know, we want to, um, we kind of want to say that the accidents, um, the accidents just hang out there like a mirage, right? Mm -hmm. um, but St. Thomas rejects that thesis for a number of reasons, one of which is that it's not the purpose of the sacrament to deceive the senses. Right. Right. I mean, God mm -hmm. isn't a law. Mm -hmm. So he's not, he's not introducing this image um, so that you'll be misled of, <laughs> of his presence. Right. Sure. Sure. Um, and, and also you know, 
there is this idea in sacraments, right? That the term sacrament originally um, had the sense of a symbol, a sign, mm-hmm. right? And um, and so, in, as the language developed in theology, people would speak of sacramentum tantum, which basically meant the sign only, only the symbol. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they would talk about the res of the sacrament, right? Sure. Uh, the the thing that's sim by the sign Mm -hmm. and when we as catholics talk about sacraments what we're actually talking when we say that's a sacrament right we usually mean by that is what the theologians in the middle ages called res et sacramentum Mm -hmm. the sign and the thing it symbolizes right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um together Right. right so um so the sacramentum part the symbol is an is an important part of what the sacrament is right absolutely it's just yeah. a thing abstractly mm-hmm. and when you get into the protestant reformation right you you'll start to see a tendency eventually mm-hmm. to um to kind of want the thing but not the symbol the symbol mm-hmm. becomes sort of starts to get to seen as a, a a superficial thing that maybe even gets in the way of obscure Mm. what's really at issue that real thing the mm-hmm. res becomes mm-hmm. all there is and right there's this idea in some in some aspects of protestantism that we actually want to strip the symbols away mm. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but that's not that's not a um that's not the mind of saint thomas and it certainly is not the patristic view of things sure sure right so the bread and the wine are important symbols right Right. Yeah. We yeah eat. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it connects to Passover, right? I mean, it connects. I mean, there's so many things that it connects yeah. to um, that they're important. Uh, um, th- their sign value, right, uh, is important. And, you know, I, I, one of the things that, that would be weird, too, if you accepted the illusion account, right, is like that starts to get pretty involved. And to be frank, kind of sounds kind of pretty weird you know a little like so like i mean let's take we got the eucharist and and you carry it from one place to the other there's this ongoing illusion right you know yeah uh, and and you know you take it to the host in the hospital to somebody who's been receiving first you know communion outside of mass and it's still you know it's deceiving all these people around you, and you maybe somebody puts it under a microscope it's still deceive. i mean yeah it could deceive just, scientific instruments yeah you start to sound like you know, this is starting to kind of sound like a bit of a stretch right um at some point and thankfully we don't have to believe that and we shouldn't believe that although i do think I think you said something about this, uh, Dr. Kelly, that made sense that a lot of people do think about it this way. Like that is that they're just appearances, right? Uh, or something like that. Why do people think it's only an illusion? I have a hypothesis. You could tell me if, if you think this is right. Um, I think that this illusion view is born really of um, a sort of post-Kantian way of thinking about this. Mm-hmm. That if something isn't, we seem to we think about things uh, either as like our natural thinking about things is there's stuff outside of my mind. It's it's really there, and I'm accountable to it. But the minute I say that um, if I make a proposal like, well, I see something, I there are appearances, but they inhere in no substance. The accidents inhere in no substance. Mm-hmm. My what happens to me? My go-to response is to say, oh appearances of things you know they're in the mind they're they belong to <laughs> uh, the realm of phenomena mm-hmm. um, which is totally disconnected to the noumenal realm right mm-hmm. they don't mm-hmm. really necessarily mm-hmm. correspond with anything mm-hmm. else so it totally makes sense that things can mm-hmm. be that way sure what, what sure. do you think about that hypothesis yeah i think that's good you know actually and I, I think there's a i think that's especially perhaps and worrisomely um attractive to maybe a very spiritual point of view right that is, oh, you know, we're kind of uh-huh. living in this world of appearances, but there's this, the the noumena, right? The is is this sort of the r- hidden reality, you know, 
behind the phenomena. Uh, you can see how somebody who's who's spiritual could see that as attractive, right? You know that the the see yeah. the phenomena just as sort of like a veil, right? Uh, and then behind that, right, we have this sort of spiritual reality. Uh, so that would be kind of a yeah, I could see why that would be attractive. And of course, there's a lot of Kantian sort of um, uh, tendencies, you know, that, that pervade our cultures. We've talked about in other other episodes. So I think that's a that's a that's a good explanation, and yeah, one that people should be aware of. I think it's Gnostic, though. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Do the accidents become the accidents of the body and blood of Christ? Mm. Mm-hmm. Does Christ just appear under those accidents? Right. Um, Thomas says no. Yeah. Now, I mean, I could see why a person might might want to hold the view that that's what happens. That that's the mm-hmm. explanation. There are problems with that view, right? Mm-hmm. Um it would and be it would be kind of a the tidy. The are pretty significant. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it would be kind of a tidy solution though if it worked, right? Because you could say, okay, well, I know the accent's got to adhere to something. You know, it's no longer bread, so now they adhere to the substance of uh, of Christ, right? So that would be kind of a. I can see how that might initially appear like a good solution. Yeah, right. So the problem is that you break the bread. Are you breaking Christ? Is <laughs> Christ's right. uh-huh. body in the Eucharist subject to? Um, fragmentation Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i think the answer to that is clearly no Mm -hmm. in fact the very logic of the eucharist right moves in the other direction Mm -hmm. the eucharist is to unite not to uh, divide Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so in other words we're we're not taking a divided humanity and then inflicting their division on christ right 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 right. this is a very important part of the christ story when you think about it right Mm -hmm. not a bone shall be broken Uh, he's um he's um He's not divided, right? Mm-hmm. And he's the source of unity, right? Mm-hmm. And Paul mm-hmm. makes, I mean, he talks about this at length. Right. So, um, so yeah, that's not, that, that's a major problem with the mm-hmm. thesis that the, that, that he takes on the accidents. Then you're yeah. breaking Christ. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a very uh, important sort of, I think, I soteriological uh, big picture uh um reason for why that would uh be problematic i think um even uh in addition to that you might want to add you know from an apologetics context a lot of the e- kind of easy arguments against um the a transubstantiation of the real presence kind of trade on this assume right that the accidents adhere in christ's substance so one common objection, you know, and I remember uh, even my kids bringing this up one time as well. Uh, how can Christ be in a million different places at once, right? As if, as if, right? Christ takes on the uh, the location, right? Um, in, in in spatial terminology uh, of the accidents, right? Well, if he was, if he did have those, you know, then yeah, it would be weird. Like Christ would be like in a million different places. Uh, so you know, you can avoid some of those kinds of uh, criticisms, right? By recognizing that the, that the accidents don't inhere in, uh, including the accidents of, of uh, space and time, don't inhere in the substance of Christ. Yeah. So um, it's interesting that in St. Thomas, there's a subtly different problem mm. uh, in which we talk about Christ being in more than one place at one time. There's a hypothesis that he displaces the substance. Mm. Mm-hmm their physical positions so what what's the difference this is a weird this is actually a weird one um (laughs) you might imagine that the problem wouldn't arise if the eucharist existed solely in one kind and there was only the consecration of one um particular right so in other words let's say that let's say they consecrated bread only and only one piece of bread well then you might you might not have exactly this problem, although you sure. still have the problem of breaking. Sure. But um, but in reality, the way the church has always celebrated the Eucharist has been that there's more than one kind, right? There's the, the body and lots of potential recipients. So lots of pieces of bread. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if Christ displaces the consecrated element, 
happens, right? Mm -hmm. Then he is actually diffusing himself into numerous different right. places. Right. Interesting. This instance here, this particular consecrated element, right, is a different, it's a distinct consecrated element than this one. Mm -hmm. And in each case, Christ has displaced a particular object. Right. You right. see what I mean? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and that, and and Thomas is like, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. that's, that's not what happens. Um, but 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 I want I don't want to just reject the thesis because I might say, well, I mean, I don't know. We have some accounts of certain saints exhibiting this power of bilocation or something. Sure. Uh -huh. Why couldn't Christ mm -hmm. do that? Um, I don't know. It's weird. But and, and I'll grant that if such a thing actually does happen, you know, it's a miracle. And when we talk about consecrating the Eucharist, we are talking about we're making a claim that a miracle is happening, right? This, mm -hmm. this particular miracle is not of our liking, but a different one is. Um, <laughs> I think, you know what I mean? I think that um, I think there's another issue, though. And that is, when, when we get into the way Aquinas actually does resolve the problem, we're going to come to see that he really thinks of the place, the physical place in this world, being lifted up into the presence of Christ rather than Christ descending into the place. Yeah, yeah. Which is that kind of, a, kind of... It's a weird concept, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you think about it in terms of the Pauline theology... Sure. Um, that like look at the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that does seem to be the kind of thing that he's talking about. So yeah. I think that's great, and I think the uh, uh, I guess that's sort of the direction correct. Um, the yeah. Um, uh, so is this related? Uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Is this related to Thomas's view um, where he rejects the idea that? Christ is present in the Eucharist in time and place according to natural species. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So um can you explain that present dis in distinction time and space? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, kind of, mm -hmm. but but let's think about what that means, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Thomas talks about is that the proper the proper accidents of Christ permanent. Once the mm -hmm. incarnation takes it's heretic. Sure. So, um, Christ has a body even in heaven, right? Right. Even even when and, he was, even when after the separation of his rational soul from his body, right? Uh, when he was dead, right in the tomb, right? We still said the hypostatic union, right? Uh, that's right. Was, was, was continued. Um, well, that's the reason, right? right yeah. So so if he really did rise from the dead, then he then he really does. He fixes the problem of death, which is that mm -hmm. you've been separated from your body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's, it's his human nature that demands that resolution, right? Right. Sure, sure. So sure. Um, he never gives up his human nature. The incarnation mm -hmm. is permanent. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that in some way, even his glorified body has accidents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what are those accidents? I don't know. They're not like anything that you and I. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you think, just think a little bit about, I mean, you get glimpses right at the end of um, a couple of the gospels, right. You know, he walks through walls. Yeah. He's right? got some you know, funky property, right. He says unusual things, right. He just appears in the room, uh, that kind of yeah. thing, obviously is in ways, interestingly enough that are, you know, during before the, um, the passion and death, right, and resurrection. You know, he didn't generally walk through walls and, and things of like that, right? Uh, whereas, no, that you know, wasn't his normal thing. Yeah. I mean, he does. There are a couple of passages where he he mysteriously seems to evade capture. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. of course the transfiguration episode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but but that that's actually an interesting. The transfiguration episode is actually right to the point, believe mm -hmm, it or not, mm -hmm. of this thing. Um, so the manner in which the glorified, the glorified um, body exists in time is very different from the way mm, that mm -hmm. you and I exist in time, right? Sure. When you and I exist in time, we're bound to a linear framework. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That appears not to be the case with, with the glorified body. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. So, as weird as that may be, uh, uh-huh. there's a there's a lot of reference to that in the scriptures. Sure. So when we're when we're making this denial, it's really when we're denying that Christ is present under the natural species of space and time, right? The normal yep. sense of space and time. Um, in part, that's because we're saying we're saying we're insisting on the reality of his risen body and the persistence of its own proper accidents. Right? That's right. Right. So uh, Thomas does want to say though that uh, there is a sacramental presence in space and time. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So let's think about the space and the time of the crucifixion. Okay. The space and the time of the resurrection, the space and the time of the ascension. Mm -hmm. And the space and the time of Christ's glorified body in the bosom of the Father. Mm. Um, in, In this way, right, Christ is present in space and time. Mm-hmm. And because, because time is not a linear reality to Christ in the glorified state, mm-hmm. um, all of those spaces and times uh, are, are a single moment. Mm. And it's into that moment that we enter when we celebrate the Eucharist, and particularly when we receive Eucharistic communion. That's interesting. It's some weird and funky stuff. Yeah, yeah, so... We have a, a non-linear time, and I guess a non-extended place. Yeah, something like that, right? It's interesting. I'm writing it down for further reflection. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. That's really it's a, it's interesting. That's a good way of putting that. So again, I, I like the formulation. Um, I like to put, I like to put it like. The place comes to exist in Christ rather than Christ coming to exist in the place. That's right. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. That's like, that makes sense. And then in that way, place takes on a somewhat a different significance, right? Uh, yeah. Than it would if we were thinking about it in the reverse order, right? Where uh, Christ takes on the place of um, the consecrated species or something like that. Yeah. Now, what if um, what if uh, a pious Catholic was to hear you saying that and was to become upset with you? Uh, because you say, wait a second, I, when I go to adoration and I'm staring up there at the host and the monstrance, right? Yeah. You know, I've been taught to think Christ is, is, is right in there, right? Um, are you saying that that's wrong and therefore I shouldn't worship the, the consecrated species? No, I think what I would say is um, right in there is where Christ is. Mm-hmm. It's a distinction, right? So okay. Christ isn't there. There is in Christ. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. So think of it, I guess, uh, you know, I like to appeal to science fiction, actually, believe it or not. Okay. Because I think, I think that some of our contemporary science fiction, um, I mean, a lot of it's just totally crazy, but, <laughs> sure. but they do have a way of, um, they do have a way of stretching concepts that, mm-hmm in my view, have managed to recover for contemporary thinkers um, at least some of the kinds of ideas that Mm -hmm. were once, how can I put it, the grist of theological reflection, right? Okay, sure. Um, We find these ideas in the Bible. For example, nonlinear time, right? The Mm -hmm. idea of an event of the future affecting an event of the past or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Clearly that that happens in the Bible. There's, there's no, mm-hmm. there's no way around that. Right. Mm-hmm. When, when, when the author of Hebrew says that Melchizedek is a type of Christ, mm-hmm. that reference is saying that Melchizedek as a historical reality is a sort of um, impression left in history by Christ, by the incarnation, mm-hmm. which hasn't yet historically occurred. Mm-hmm. Right. That this this idea is, is all over the Bible, okay. Uh, but it's you know it's a common thing in science fiction. Mm-hmm. So um, where was I going with that? The um, we're the talking about through the the, the the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, the monstrance, and oh, yeah, yeah, 
Right. So I tend to think of it analogously to like a wormhole. Okay. Right. To another dimension. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Portal, um, sort of. Thing. Yeah. So, so if you think about, okay, let me let me just be really clear about something the church actually does uh, believe in. Right. The resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. Mm-hmm. So, um, we don't pretend to know exactly what the resurrection of the body is like. Right. I mean, whatever it is, it's very, very strange. Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy for us to think of resurrection of the body being like the world as we understand it, as we imagine it is just recreated. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think that that's really what um, I don't think that's really what I, I don't think I'm not sure about that. Okay. You know, St. Paul says St. Paul talks about um, how, you know, you'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye and um and he talks about how um how you know eye is not seen ear is not heard it hasn't entered into the imagination of man what god has promised so i think what we're talking about is whatever it is it's something very different from our normal experience of reality Mm -hmm. and yet whatever it is it's bodily resurrection Mm -hmm. right so there's a there's a bodily glorified reality Mm -hmm. um the physical universe is not annihilated. Right, right. Right, but it's transformed. Mm-hmm. And and I guess I want to say that if you if you think about if you think about the consecrated elements, what is it that I'm adoring? What is it? How, where's my vision trained? Mm-hmm. My vision is trained at this opening to this other to this other reality. Right, right. Um in the book of revelation we see um you know the language of uh uh the time here not chronos right linear time but kairos is very near right um or or to translate it maybe a little bit more uh literally is is pressed up against us so if you sort of imagine um again in science fiction terms right Imagine these these overlapping um, dimensions shifted by phase or something, right? And you can you can pass through from one to the other, like a semi permeable membrane mm-hmm. from one dimension to the next. Um, the image in the scriptures, right, of um, of the ladder, Jacob's ladder, climbing up into heaven, and you can go up and down on it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of the thing that we're talking about i think Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it may seem really weird but i do think it's a biblical concept okay yeah that's interesting it's a uh, um kind of a sort of a window into uh the reality of christ beyond right um uh, that sort of thing so you are worshiping christ there right yeah um even if you want to say the the elements are in some sense in Christ, not adhering in his substance, but uh, nevertheless sort of uh, in Christ rather than saying that Christ is in uh, the place and time according to natural species. Right. And I think that's part of what um, mere transformation, right? Or Mm. or nutrition. Mm -hmm. Christ doesn't eat the the bread and the wine. Mm -hmm. If he did Mm -hmm. that, he would take some of it into himself and... (laughs) And right. he would kind of one of the objections, right, um, during the Middle Ages, to this idea of the real presence, was um, that Christ would just get bigger and bigger all the time, right? <laughs> as he appropriated more stuff to himself. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. And that's, but again, you're not attributing the accidents to Christ, the dimensionality right. and so forth. That's right. That's right. Um, and he's not eating the thing; he's not taking it in digesting what he needs to build more of himself Mm -hmm. and then um excreting the rest of it as waste Mm -hmm. saint thomas addresses that issue and and he's like no that's not right yeah that's what we're talking about is there one uh another uh of these uh uh, is there another one of these false hypotheses you want to look at yeah i want to i think he he addresses a number but i want to address um annihilation okay as a, a hypothesis right um, now, the annihilation thesis would would probably correlate with the illusion mm. hypothesis for the accidents, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. 
So annihilation would be uh, there was bread and there was wine. Mm -hmm. And now there isn't bread and wine anymore because God has uncreated them. Mm -hmm. This is a really, this is actually a really subtle Mm -hmm. and important thing. Thomas rejects the thesis of annihilation. Um, I don't, um, I don't think he has a particularly good reason, to be honest. Okay. The reason that he gives is not especially um, strong in my view, if I understand him correctly, right? Because he he basically, what he does, he affirms the consequent. Um, He says that annihilation can't be the case because the the only way Christ could come to be present in the sacrament is by the substance of bread and wine being changed into him. Mm. And and to me, that just sounds like he's saying, well, that can't be the case because that's not the way it is. Mm. But um, but I have another reason for rejecting the thesis of annihilation. Okay, and, and that is that um, it does not appear it doesn't appear to be consistent with the character of God as revealed in Scripture mm. that He annihilates. Sure, um, He creates. But if you think of creation as a sort of pledge on God's part, God wills your existence. God doesn't right. change His mind. Mm -hmm. i think i mean for me that um that god god wills to create you sure regardless of your response to him Mm -hmm. he doesn't withdraw that he doesn't withdraw that will to create you you could close yourself off from him you could flee from god Mm -hmm. do what you need to do but god is always going to create you Um, And and that's one of the reasons why hell doesn't go away right Mm, yeah it was was kind of a uh, another another topic there but yeah, yeah it's yeah. another topic but but i think for me the annihilate the god does mm-hmm. not annihilate mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. doesn't the undo consistently rejected yeah he doesn't undo the created order right yeah uh, and, and uh that sort of thing yeah i think that's a, that's, that seems to be a, a good answer and an important one um there um it, it would it would just sort of be kind of yeah yeah I, I think that's a good that's a good answer so what um what do you take is uh, what is thomas's sort of um final sort of best formulation uh right. that he tries to come to about the 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 metaphysics the ontological reality of uh the eucharist okay so this is let's get into the meat of it now because I, okay. I think um uh we want to come in order to understand this at all we really need to have some idea of what an accident is from a (laughs) Thomistic perspective. That's Uh the key thing. Um, Because I mean, you know, the audience might be throwing their hands up right now saying it's, you're saying that (laughs) there are these accidents, they Uh appear in no substance, but they're not illusions. I don't know what to believe. Uh uh Right. uh Sure. Um, And, and we're not even addressing, like we didn't even talk about consubstantiation. Right. Sure. That, the mm. church does not the catholic church doesn't accept and and thomas mm. thomas doesn't accept either um you know we're in consubstantiation you still have the bread and the wine mm-hmm. co-present to the uh the body and blood of christ uh, right right and and i think that you know there the reason that the church doesn't accept that view mm-hmm. is that um is that it seems to me that you end up when it comes to the body and blood of Christ. You you actually end up with Berengar of Tours and John Calvin. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you follow what I'm saying, right? Yeah. What are you actually encountering? Well, you're actually encountering physically the bread and wine, right, and only right. spiritually then are you encountering mm-hmm, Christ. Mm-hmm. You haven't solved that particular problem of creating a a, a, a bodily union between you and Christ. Right. Right. I so you. um, so that's not the solution. Mm-hmm. you have accidents in hearing and no substance how um well the fir- and they're not illusions right the first thing to understand is that from from the point of view of thomas's metaphysic um even though this particular hypothesis is extraordinary um nonetheless right Accidents are not mere appearances. Correct. Correct. But this is the thing we need to understand. Accidents are not, in Thomas, mere appearances. They're right. not just phenomena. Right. Right. They're, right. they're properties of physical objects. Right. Yeah. It's so important. Uh, so often I've run into it. 
this uh, in my own uh, teaching and, and so forth, you know, you, you teach this excellent distinction between substance and accidents, right? Um, and, and, and then there's a, a, a sort of tendency almost to sort of think, well, everything that's not a substance isn't really real right uh-huh. uh in some sense and no that's that's not correct right um you know accidents are real they're realities they're they're realities that are very dependent realities right uh by their nature but they're still realities right um you know a lot about us our character i mean we think about the uh, say a, the habit the virtue of justice is a habit that's an accident right <laughs> the mm-hmm. uh, uh that adheres in uh a man's psyche, right? Uh, it's it's not his essence. Otherwise, he would necessarily be just, and we know that men are not, right? Uh, right, right. So, um, he would never not be just. Exactly, <laughs> right, right, right. But we sadly know that that's not the case. So, uh, accidents are realities, right? Uh, they're secondary, right? They're they're modifying, they're dependent, right? Um, but they are realities, as you as as you said. So, um, let's think about uh, dimensionality. Okay. Right. So the species take up space. They mm-hmm. displace objects in space. Thomas mm-hmm. talks about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's a real physical property. OK. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's hard for us to think about. This is a, not an easy concept. Right. Because when I think of something taking up space. You know, say I, I my my mug um, takes up physical space. And I could say, well, what is it about the mug that allows it to do that? <laughs> right, right. I, what I'm inclined to say is that what allows the mug to take up this physical space is the actual reality itself of the mug. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. But in Aquinas's metaphysic, he's saying, well, there's an underlying reality, a sort of... Um, uh, a logical sort of a, a a logical structure right okay and when we say that um the dimension there's dimensionality mm-hmm. there's texture there's color these are real properties mm-hmm. um but none of them has any none of them makes any real sense in itself right, right. except as the properties of some underlying um, some underlying thing that makes them all cohere as a unit. Sure, sure, right? sure. Right, and and that's that's the substratum. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what's not there anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The right? idea is it an illusion, right? No, it's not. No, the yeah, yeah. all that stuff is still there. Right, extension is still there. Right, weight is still there. Um, you know, all of the, those sorts of quantitative realities are still there, right? Um, <clears throat> the, uh, what's no longer there is, is that, as I said, that underlying um, logical structure, right? That right. makes it cohere to be bread and wine, right? But you would still find, you know, sugar and other various compounds in the bread, right? Yeah. Right. Now that's, re- this is where it really gets, I got to say, this is where I think we, we start to look at um, the reasons that in time people have proposed that we look for other terminology. Mm-hmm. Um, because obviously this, this articulation involves certain metaphysical presuppositions. Sure. And if we, if we were to alter our metaphysic, if we were to decide that that metaphysic no longer provides the best explanation for the physical universe, Mm -hmm. um, then we would have an issue, right? We might have to revisit this terminology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Currently, I'm not sure there is another metaphysic that we can appeal to. Sure. Um, But I mean, (laughs) metaphysics are not, that's human knowledge, right? I mean, that's the product of, Mm -hmm. that's the product of natural reasons, reflection and reality. And it's subject to, improvement yeah i mean i think what you might want to say is um at this point it's the most adequate um articulation right yeah we've Um, tried some other things and they haven't worked and one of the big problems i mean is the whole (laughs) 
impetus of 19th and 20th century philosophy is away from metaphysics, right? Yeah, <laughs> you so know, you're so like, find your yeah, yeah. it's just, it's going to be really tough, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's it, whether you go sort of in a kind of uh, idealist direction or a scientific materialist direction, either direction, right? It, it just not, you're not, there's not going to be a metaphysical yeah. tools that you need to try to uh, improve on the account. Yeah, no, I think ni- neither of them, neither of them is going to be sufficient to the task of a, mm-hmm. of a Catholic view of reality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. You've got to have some sort of hylomorphic, some sort of hylomorphic metaphysic. I don't know. Uh-huh. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be Thomas's. Um, but the physical world is real as mm-hmm. physical. Right, right. It's yeah. not just an illusion. It's mm-hmm. not just phenomena in the mind. Right, right. Um, and the spiritual world is real, right? It's mm. not just a, an epiphenomenon of the material universe. Sure, right. <laughs> yeah, right. So That's whatever right. your That's metaphysic right. is going to be, it's going to have to account for the reality of both those dimensions of things. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So, um, so we end up with the position, right, that the Eucharist, right, is substantially Christ, right, is the substance of Christ, or the substance is Christ, I should say. Right. Uh, and but also that the accidents are real, not adhering in the substance of Christ, but still real. Um preserved by god's miraculous power i think if i remember in a catechetical setting i've seen i've heard that you know we want to say something like there's a two-fold uh miracle right in um the eucharist right that is there's Mm -hmm. the preservation of the accidents uh as well as the transformation of the substance yeah right and i guess what i want to say is um so the the glorified christ his particular attributes right mm, mm-hmm, are imperceptible mm-hmm. to us this side of the parousia yeah that's great yeah, yeah. um and so he gives us a way of perceiving where mm-hmm. it is mm-hmm. or how can i say he gives us a way of of perceiving his presence right yeah um mm-hmm. and so Very when good. we approach mm-hmm. those consecrated elements right 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 through the encounter with the accidents, we mm-hmm. we pass through that wormhole. Right? Yeah, we, it's yeah, that's really excellent, Rich. The uh, because uh, we really we're, it's not as a because I, I, sometimes when I go work through this, it, I, I sort of kind of get like, well, this is a little bit ad hoc, right? Uh, we're uh-huh. just trying to kind of put up a framework that makes it plausible, right? Uh-huh. Um, but there's more to it than that, right? Uh, it does avoid, I, I guess, contradictions and irrationalities, and that's important, but. Um, it, it does, it, it guards the integrity of Christ's own resurrected body, right? Um, and recognizing its um, kind of transcendent glorified properties, right? Um, and the preservation of the accident of the accidents is really there so that we can have right a signification of that uh real glorified body right um, yeah which is really actually with us that's right yeah i think that's excellent um uh i hope that, that everybody's getting this that that, that it really is about um there's a controversy and i'm just going to mention it without delving into it there's a controversy between lutherans and calvinists on this point uh i think it's called the extra Calvinistica or something like that. Right. (laughs) And the idea is that there's some sort of controversy about the relationship of Christ's risen body and um, the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, the Lutherans object to um, something about the way, you know, Calvinists deal with that, but it is uh, interesting. It's important to see, I think, see here, right. That, a part of this mystery, and maybe a part that we we're not we we don't hold to the to the um, to our minds enough, right? Um, is that this concerns Christ's glorified and risen body? Yeah, right. Uh, and, and and that it brings us into contact with that reality. Yeah, that, that's essential, and it goes back it goes back to the New Testament, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when when uh, the author of Hebrews talks about um, Christ as the high priest, the perfect high priest, right? Sure. He says sure. he passes through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands. 
Right. Yeah. So th- this is all about the ascension of Christ into heaven. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, and so when you link uh, the body of Christ theology of Saint Paul, and you know the Yoannin, um idea of um, of the, the literal true presence, mm-hmm. um, it, you you see the picture, right? I mean, it seems to me that the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist is. I mean, I'll say it. It's it's completely scriptural. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. That's great, uh, Rich. Thanks for taking us through all that. Do you want to give us a, a final uh, comment before we wrap up? Yeah, I think um, so. I think all I want to say to to end is um, <clears throat> certainly what the church teaches about the Eucharist is very strange, sure, and weird. But I I, I became comfortable a long time ago. <clears throat> with the idea that being Catholic means being okay with holding weird things that being mm-hmm. something weird doesn't mean that it's not true. Sure. Sure. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's strange, but nonetheless, right. Um, if we buy into the whole incarnation thing to begin with, right. Right. I do think this is where it ends up. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I liked, uh, I think, the really important, um, what you introduced uh, earlier in our conversation, the idea that that what our, our real union with Christ in uh, the Eucharist, right, is important because what happens to Christ's body then also happens right. to our body uh, and therefore mm-hmm. translated into resurrection, ascension, and glorification, right? Um, or not ascension, but resurrection and glorification. Um, yeah. So those are, uh, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a powerful sort of schematic, right? Mm-hmm. In which to see right, uh, um, the, the reality of the mystery. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Wilson Kelly. It was a great conversation. A lot of insights there, a lot to think about. I hope that uh, um, all those listening or watching uh, have found the conversation useful and edifying. Um, Remember to check out all of our content over at catholicstudiesacademy.com. Remember to subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube, remember to join our YouTube channel um, if you uh, feel so inclined and to, uh, you can, you know, help us grow and support us by uh, hitting that thank you button down at the bottom below our screen and contributing to our work. Uh, Until next time, God bless.